Hey, hey, and welcome to Thursday Night Reconnected. And I'm stoked because this is the first time John has been here for Reconnected. John, welcome. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy sports filled life to do this. No, thanks for having me. This is like I watch you every week and now I'm on the show. I feel like it's <laughs> they called my name with the price is right. And I came down and like I'm I'm, I'm ready to bid. I'm ready. Let's go. <laughs> well, you've been training for years doing the Oscar show. And now we figured right. it's time for the real thing. I'm so stoked that you're here. Uh, you are genuinely one of my favorite people in all of this, and uh, I, I'm just stoked to have you around. And love the backdrop. I, I don't think we've had the the collection yeah, backdrop I, before. I'm, a, I'm I'm in a little bit of a transitional period with my uh, my movie room. It's because it's it doubles as my wife's office, and it's sort of outgrown that space. And so I'm in a um, a transitional period. We're calling it with the collection. <laughs> so the I only... have one, the one clean corner. The only bad part is we don't get to see all the Emmys. Well, that's true. Yeah, the, the, it's, I don't have a wide enough lens. <laughs> what a flex! God, I love that. Um, yeah, that's uh, congratulations. By the way, on uh, on uh, the, the most recent one. That's what five now. That's six now. Yeah, six. Jeez. Yeah. So yeah, it was that's. It's always a fun mail day when that comes here. So it's uh, my 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 wife. You know, sees the box and she's like, "You have more movies at the front door." And so I was like, "All right, awesome." And then I was like, "Oh, this is better. This is actual like you know an Emmy." Right. <laughs> The you you could sell that to buy more movies, yeah. That, that's true, yeah. You know, if, if, <laughs> if, if we hit rock bottom, I have at least I have those. Uh, just before we get into everything, uh, Sibner was saying, Is uh, John ordering porn with us later? For heads up, for everybody that doesn't know, the Melusine Valentine's Day sale uh, that doesn't start till tomorrow at noon. This is the first time they've done that where it's not midnight tonight. The sale for Vinegar Syndrome is tomorrow at noon, and uh, everything on the Melusine site will be on sale. Go check it out. Uh, they got a couple new titles coming. It looks like it's going to be pretty great. Uh, are, are you one that's dipped into any of the adult titles so far from them? Uh, I have not. No, and thank God they're not doing it at midnight, so I am not a part of that. <laughs> <laughs> totally get it. Uh, we're going to get into a bunch of stuff, but as I just alluded to, John, you've been here for all of the uh, the Oscar shows so far, and I, I'm not even sure if this is true yet, but I did see this get posted today. Um, it looks like they might be introducing a best casting category starting in 2026. If that's the case, how do you feel? Um, I am one of those people that never complains about the length of the Oscars. Like they can go all night for all I care. I love I, I right. love it so much. Um, I don't need them to speed it up, add more category, add a stunt category. I think this is a great category because it's um it sort of goes beyond just uh, the performance and it gets to, you know, um, you know, Elvis, you know, we got to cast Elvis. Like, you know, that's, you know, <laughs> it always comes back to Elvis on this show, doesn't it? Um, yes. So, you know, you, you, you got you, you to find the right Elvis that makes the movie. And so that kind of it's it's an interesting category. It's going to be a whole new um, way of thinking about things. So I, I think it's great. Uh, I, man, I, I'm torn because I agree that best casting is, is a really good idea, but also I kind of want to see like a best, I mean, obviously stunts is the, the obvious go-to yeah. that should be here, but I, I want to see something for best ensemble, like something for mm -hmm. everybody comes together and just has this perfect chemistry and some way to, to, to quantify that, which obviously is nigh impossible, but that'd be really cool. Totally. Yeah. I mean, I, maybe they just don't want to step on the Screen Actors Guild's uh, thunder. That's kind of their big thing. Right, right. Um, but no, I'd be all for that. Bring on all the awards. Bring Everybody gets a trophy. That would be that would be swell. Uh, <laughs> enough about the Oscars. Uh, we will be discussing the Oscars more soon when the, the uh, you know ceremony actually happens. But it's time for uh, some fun stuff. What what uh, what pickups you got come in recently? Pickups. OK um pickups i have uh peeping tom uh studio canal Lucky. i finally get to replace this which Ooh. i've had for a long time <laughs> i think this thing has been out of print for a little while yeah but yeah this dvd gets to go bye bye now so we have this now um i assume criterion's eventually going to get that um but i'm no longer in the business of waiting for a criterion um so i'm happy with the studio canal disc it was there i wanted it um so i got it um, I got uh, Super Mario Brothers from Umbrella. Nice. This is one of my all-time childhood nostalgia 
favorites here. This is just, you can't top this. This is just, you know, Bob Hoskins, John Leguizamo. It's just money. Um, another, another nostalgia pickup that just came in recently. Three Ninjas. I got this from Morbid. Uh, Sweet. <laughs> I mean, this is just, I was obsessed with the first couple movies when I was a kid. 1992 was the first one. And so I, that was right in my wheelhouse as a five-year-old. Um, <laughs> what else I got here? Oh, since you just recently um, interviewed him, Suitable Flesh. Ooh, yes. Good flick. Good flick. Yeah, one of, one of, my, uh, one of my, my favorite films of the year last year. Um, what else I got over here? Uh, High Tension came in. I actually have Ooh. never seen this, so this will be a first time oh, watching. Oh, interesting. Yeah. How do, you, how do you feel about the rest of the, the French extremity wave that happened? I, I, it's such a blind spot for me. I, so I am kind of, I'm kind of a novice when it comes to those films. And I feel like High Tension might be a good jumping off point. I don't know. I, um, I own Martyrs. I have not put that in the player yet. I just haven't found the right time. I feel like that's you got to be in the mood for that. Yeah, <laughs> so certainly. I haven't been in that mood quite yet, but maybe we'll get there after the show. I don't know. <laughs> you you got to be ready for a lot of gravity with that one. And yeah. it's it's different than the rest of the French Extremity because even something like Inside, like there's some, there's some breathing points. With Martyrs, it is really bad, and then mm -hmm. you just start to feel bad as it goes on and on. So yeah. And yeah. You know, I'm kind of into that because I I love like, I love movies where you feel bad. I love to feel something, you know. And exactly. That, that, you know, it's uh, you know I love Von Trier. I love Haneke. I I love movies with with a with a severe sense of dread. So maybe I I need to dive head first. You know, it's just about finding the time. You know. Um, I would agree. And like, and like everybody else, I my last one would be I have Conan that came in. So nice. Excited to have this. So that'll be fun to give a spin. Those are my pickups. Uh, How about you? I've got uh, the other side, which I kind of feel bad showing these because I know a lot of people are still waiting. But uh, OCN finally arrived uh, literally today or yesterday, I think. Uh, so uh, giving some love to Bill Plimpton with the tune from Deaf Crocodile. as uh, uh, Literally as Craig says, sorry I'm late. What's going on, Craig? Look, okay. uh, ha had to show it off. I I'm very, very excited to get that in. Um, the other one that I was probably most excited for this month is Gay USA. This is the release from Altered Innocence, which is full nice. of uh, some documentaries and a bunch of extra features. Um, but maybe, you know, the biggest story from the month for Vinegar Syndrome is the cinematograph releases. And these are these are insanity. I mean, there's something else, man. I, I the, <laughs> these things are. I mean, the attention to detail, the branding, the feeling um it's it's wild i'm really looking forward to seeing what they have next i mean the way that justin has sort of built it up it's like i feel like anything's possible at this point yeah it's it's pretty impressive what they've been able to do just with the first month with two releases mm -hmm. um i will likely be watching little darlings here in the next couple of days and red rock west soon after that but it's I don't know. It's a big deal for Justin. Uh, I know that he's put a lot of work into both of those, especially for two films that people have been literally begging for on yeah. physical media for years. And Red Rock obviously got a couple recent releases, but now, I mean, now you got your 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 choices for Red Rock. That's the hard part. Really, yeah. And Little Darlings. I mean, that's that's huge. So I that movie was sort of um, not my radar ever until I heard it um, talked about on the uh, Video Archives podcast. Yep. With Quentin Tarantino and Roger Avery. Um, and they had a whole episode as, you know, it was, it was devoted to little darlings. And so I immediately like went looking for it and there was nothing out there and orbit had a DVD and I'm pretty sure that's like a, I don't know what that is. <laughs> it's something, it's, it's a bootleg. It's, it's a bootleg. So, um, I was thrilled to actually get a, um, a real copy of it. So very cool. It's a big deal. Uh, and the other big thing is you watch a lot of movies, especially modern cinema. Cinema? What was that? Cinema. What have you been watching? <laughs> oh, man. So if you remember during our Oscar show, my one blind spot that I hadn't been able to see yet was Zone of Interest. Yep. So I saw Zone of Interest um, in New York City at the Alamo Draft House, Lower Manhattan. Um, and it was just, I mean, I don't need, I mean, that's one of those movies that ends and you just, sink into the chair it's like it's like yep. uh it was quite an experience um the sound design on that movie was 
I just got a chill that going down my arm thinking yep. about the, the, the audio on that film and the way he shot it. It's almost like a, like CCTV. I mean, the, the restraint that he uses, oh, yeah. it's quite a, um, it's quite an achievement. I and mean, he really shackles you to that chair and does not let you move. I mean, how do you show, how do you show the, the, Oh, the who it is. <laughs> <laughs> How do you how do you show the unfathomable? I mean, you really you, you can't. Right. And he never really takes you beyond that wall. Um, but he certain what his his strategy is just as effective or more because it exists here, you know. Yeah, it it's I I believe he was quoted as saying he left like five or six cameras just running full time in in the house just to be able to capture like the nuances of the movement of people going through the house and to be able to get the dread of nothing moving and just hearing oh. the sounds and it's so perfect oh it's haunting it is haunting i mean it's when i left the theater i i go you know i don't i'm not sure i ever want to see that again but as the the days have gone by i find myself thinking about it and that's how you know a movie is really dug in and I really, I would, I can't wait for it to come out uh, on discs. Like I really want to revisit that. Um, but my my other my other watches, I really dove head first into Jonathan Glazer the last couple of days. Um, my I'd only ever seen Under the Skin, and so right. I'd never seen um, Sexy Beast and uh, Birth. Um, I watched I watched Sexy Beast two or three days ago. Um, blew blew me away. Totally blew me away. It's um. It's like a 90 minute uh, crime movie, um, razor sharp performances. Um, ben Kingsley plays the the villain. I'm not sure there's ever been a, a movie in the last 25 years. A villain has been that scary and done so little in the film. It's scary as hell. Um, and Birth, I, I, I knew nothing about this movie. It's Nicole, uh, Nicole Kidman. Um, the premise is her husband dies and 10 years later, a little boy comes to her door claiming to be her husband. And it goes places, man. It goes places. Um, I watched that today actually. And um, it's as much a possession movie as it is a family drama. It is like, <laughs> it is scary. I, I wrote this on letterbox. It has the freakiest ever kid on a swing scene that's very specific i know but kid on a swing scene i was like oh my god it was um i'm into it i so i'm like all in on jonathan glazer now i uh i've never seen birth and in fact i don't is there even a release of that at all i don't know i don't think so i i i you know i did a criterion i watched it on criterion Interesting. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I, I've I've loved Under the Skin, Sexy Beast. I saw so long ago. I think I was probably just too young and jaded. I, I should not oh, have watched so it then. I need to rewatch it for sure. Yeah. Um, but yes, uh, Under the Skin. If if you have never seen it or on the fence about it, it is a very very evocative, wild movie that will uh, make you feel things as well. Just like we talked about a little while ago. It is yeah. incredible. Yeah, totally. I, I actually am going to watch that probably next. I haven't watched that since it, maybe since it came out. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. So, and so uh, when, I, when I went to go see um, the Zone of Interest, you know how Alamo does like the the curated like pre-show yeah. videos and stuff, and they played all of Jonathan Glazer's music videos, and so I was like, this wow. guy has done everything, you know, music yeah. videos, commercials, and like. Even his commercials were like, "Holy shit, that's a masterpiece!" <laughs> They're like, "I am like fully on board the Jonathan Glazer train." I'm so glad he got nominated for uh, best director, and obviously the film and best picture. Yeah, this is a big deal. I'm very curious to see how it goes. It's it's one of the ones that I feel like is still sort of ramping up towards the show and could be one of the the surprises that night. I, I mean, you never know. Uh, Sibner says there's a DVD for Birth, but nothing more. So mm. that makes sense. Uh, okay, so recent watches for me. Uh, I'm gonna go in order from uh, most ludicrous to least ludicrous here. Um, <laughs> I uh, because it dropped on Max, I watched Dick's the Musical, the uh, A24 musical from last year. Did you watch it yet? Not yet. I saw that on there and I downloaded it to my uh, my iPad for my flight today. I did not get to it though because I had an early flight, so I took a snooze. 
I didn't watch Dix the Musical. At it it would have woke you up, that's for sure. <laughs> uh, this is a wild movie. Uh, it's funny. It is absurdist humor from from corner to corner, but it works. Uh, a lot of times they they could have easily just gone just over the edge of absurd, but it. It, it somehow makes sense, even with the sewer rats, which if you've not seen the commercial for it, uh, I totally get that not making any sense. But when you watch it, man, uh, this is a weird, weird, funny, uh, pretty good movie that most people will likely hate um, for for many, many reasons. Yeah, I, I went on to Max today and I saw the top two movies were Dick's the Musical and Barbie. So um, <laughs> they're certainly... Um, you know they're they're going for it, Max. <laughs> uh, the next one I showed my kids Harriet the Spy. I had not seen this in years, and uh, man, Harriet the Spy holds up. Uh, this is like Mean Girls before Mean Girls, and done in such a unique way because they're younger, and it's it's just so good. Like Michelle Trachtenberg is great in this. I have not. I literally have not watched that since it came out, but I have seen. Who, who's the adult? Lee. Rosie O'Donnell. I thought it was Rosie O'Donnell. She's in all those like nineties yep. kid adolescent movies. Yes. Um, wow, Harriet the Spy. Um, that that just <laughs> took me back. <laughs> also streaming on Max at the moment. And I, I would love now that Paramount's kind of opening the vault for some of these, mm -hmm. I would love to see somebody put out some of these old Nickelodeon movies like Harriet the Spy or uh Snow Day or um, the the brink or was that um, no that was Disney. Oh, I don't those, well, I, I was really into the Nickelodeon shows like Pete and Pete. Um, what was the other one? The Adventures of Alex Mack. You remember that mm -hmm. one? That, when you said Harry the Spy, that's the one that popped in my head right away. Um, uh, Salute your shorts. That was one I think. Camp no show. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah, that that was um, some quality programming. Really kind of shaped <laughs> our, uh, you know. It led to all this. <laughs> it really did. Yeah, Salute Your Shorts was the show. And then I think you were about to say Camp Nowhere, which was the... Uh, That's a movie. It is a movie. And Kino did release that a few years ago. I, I own it. Yeah, I love that movie. It's got... It's um, great. Who's in that Christopher movie? Lloyd. Christopher Lloyd, yes. It went out of print, and now it goes for like $85 on eBay. Oh, really? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so next, uh, next ludicrous level, um, I finally watched One False Move, the Criterion 4K. Uh, this oh. was also in the imprint Neo Noir. I think it was in the second box set. It is, uh, Billy Bob Thornton's like big breakout thing because he wrote the screenplay for it, starred in it as this awkward, crazy, uh, dude from Arkansas that is just super like, not even redneck or hick, but like borderline, like almost that Cajun level where he's out in the middle of nowhere and barely uses full English. Uh, but he ends up in California and there's this random night of debauchery that happens. And uh, there's some pretty brutal killing scenes. And then he and two others go on the run all the way back to Arkansas from LA. And uh, the story itself, harrowing, really well done, directed fantastically. But then it has this super abrupt, we really should have had a little bit more of an mm. ending. And so it was really great. And then it was nothing, just way too quickly. A little bit of a sour spot at the end, but I, I still recommend it. This movie is incredible. The acting is just fantastic. And uh, it feels very, I think it came out in 90 or 91. And it feels very like late 80s neo-noir in that gross sort of very realistic feeling. Yeah, that one's been on my list. I have that disc too. I haven't watched it yet. Um, uh, but that, I mean, I, so there was a director that came out. Maybe it was on Letterbox or something, but came out and said that was his favorite movie. I'm trying to remember who it was. Um, but is that is that Bill Paxton in it too? Bill Paxton is Bill in that. Yeah, and he's yeah. he's incredible. He's what else, what is he not incredible in? It's yeah, true. He's, he's it's true. Incredible. Uh, the last one that I will bring up, uh, one that I saw years ago that I, I've basically said I've never seen it because it was so long ago. And this was basically like a real first time watch for me. The quintessential New York movie. I finally watched Taxi Driver with my wife. Wow. Yeah. Um, I, I Again, I'd seen this years ago and I, I know, you know, most of the scenes from it, but it's not the, the gravity of it. And I mean, I don't know what else to say. Just if you've never seen Taxi Driver, this is a masterpiece. You've... You've likely been spoiled of some of the crazier stuff about it, but 
this is a movie that is going to again feel sort of gross and stick with you and just feel a bit harrowing and unfortunately fairly prescient i mean there's a lot of things about this that feel very of you know three or four years ago when we were you know hitting a lot of the uh uh incel manifestos in different corners of the world and a couple people going on some sprees and it's uh it's one that is going to be something that needs to be watched many many times because there's so much in this movie absolutely i mean it's it's really kind of amazing when you look at martin scorsese isn't it it's the year 2023 he's his his, his latest film has six seven eight nine nominations in the academy awards <laughs> you kind of you kind of forget where he comes from i mean he was made i mean he made taxi driver i mean you putting in the taxi driver for basically the first time that's almost like putting in citizen kane i mean that is that is a holy grail yeah cornerstone film that will always be there no matter what and um he's just um you lose sight of it a little bit because you see the quirky old man doing tiktok videos now you forget man he was he, he had an edge to him man he was he was um he was doing things nobody else was doing back then for the mainstream. Yes, absolutely. Um, and I do want to say, Sibner says, uh, honestly, Scorsese gives one of the best performances in Taxi Driver. He really does. And uh, what's funny is I had to point out to my wife, I said, you know who that was in that last scene? She goes, no. And I, and I told her, she goes, he's really young. I said, well, you can't be 80 forever. I mean, yeah, <laughs> he was young at one point. This is a long time ago. <laughs> it's great. Yeah, I, I, I love how his early films are basically home movies. You know, he's in them, his mother's in them, his father's, in, uh, I think he's seen a couple things. It's, um, it's pretty cool. Yeah. He's got quite a few. And I think, uh, I think De Niro's wife is in taxi driver for one scene too. Oh, for, really? Like she's like in a, she's in a couple of, ago? yeah, <laughs> his wife at the time, of course. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I think she was in that one and then maybe the next movie. Okay. I don't I, remember. I actually didn't know that. I, uh, I, I'm very much on a big Scorsese kick right now. I, I'm, we're considering doing a full filmography this year and I might do Scorsese, but everybody's been doing that because of killers. Yeah. I mean, that would, I mean, it's, it's, it's Scorsese. And I, I was just thinking, so not only is Scorsese nominated this year, Jodie Foster is also nominated this year. I mean, and we we all know her iconic role there, so it's just it's just kind of funny when you, you you, you revisit things like that, and they're you know the shows the it's 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 time, but at the same time, these artists have been making movies for fifty plus years. You know, it's just crazy. Right, blows my mind. Fifty plus years at like the height of his craft too. Yes. <laughs> that's yeah. that's the crazy part. I I you know, there's been many people that have argued Killers is top five in his career, just like Taxi Driver. And when you really start to think about that, that is that is a compelling and crazy argument. Yeah, man, there's there's very there's very few people that are that, that get the, the funding, you know, get carte blanche basically to do what they want now. Obviously, places like Netflix and Apple have helped that because they just burn money at this point. Um, but if they're going to burn money, I'm happy for them to burn it on him. I mean, that's okay. I'm, I'm cool with that. I am as well. Uh, one more piece of news I wanted to jump into before we go into the actual announcements. This doesn't happen all that often, but it's actually physical media related. So uh, it appears that Warner Brothers and Discovery sent out some random polls to some of their A-list email members uh, to ask about catalog films that they might like to see remastered in 4K. Now, some of these make really obvious sense. Like The Conjuring is one of the biggest franchises in the world right now. Of course, people are going to pick that. But there's some really, really interesting ones on here. Uh, Blade 2 and 3, not huge titles, but if they can put those out on 4K, a lot of people are going to be very happy. Blade 2 is pretty damn good. Um, yeah, this, this is, this is. I mean, there's not there's not a movie on this list that you wouldn't want in 4K. The ones that stand out, obviously, are the Terminator films. We, we don't have the original and the second one sucks. Right. Um, uh, eyes, eyes Wide Shut, that would be huge. Dog Day Afternoon. Uh, for, for genre fans, the biggest one on here, it's rather shocking to see the nightmare on Elm street yeah. films and they list all the way from 84 to 2010. So oh, that seems like they're claiming that they have the rights to all of them. And this hmm. means they're most likely considering that was now, that not, was that not the case? They had to have, were they multiple studios over the course of. Uh, well, New Line had them for the most part, but okay. uh, there's been some rumors that the Craven Estate had the rights to some of them. So if they are offering this in a poll, 
it looks like they probably have all of them. Otherwise, that wouldn't be listed as an option. That's sweet. I mean, that's people have been waiting for that for a long time. Right. And now it's been almost a year and a half since I saw the 4K remaster of the first film in the theater. And it looked beautiful, by the way. So I am I'm very, very hopeful that this is the year for the Nightmare films. But man, the, the full list, if you're not watching this live, Blade 2 and 3, Caddyshack, The Conjuring films, Dances with Wolves, another one that would be just stunning. Uh, Dirty Harry, Friday. How do we not have Friday on 4K yet? <laughs> the Lethal Weapon films, Nightmare on Elm Street films, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest. That is in desperate need of a remaster. A thousand percent. Uh, the Terminator films, Outlaw Josie Wales, Pale Rider, Bridges of Madison County, Interview with the Vampire, Eyes Wide Shut, Dog Day Afternoon, and Constantine. I feel like all of these would do very well in a really nice 4K release. And the other thing is, is it's Warner Brothers, and they are the ones who have been releasing these lavish editions in the UK and you know here's hoping that they were looking at that as a testing ground if these are going to sell better maybe they start bringing more of that to the US that would be very very nice this is this is great news i mean how, how do you get on this a list email newsletter though like, this? <laughs> who, that, that's who a big you? big question i had as well <laughs> I, I would love to see that uh I, I anything to be able to give any sort of uh feedback on these titles would have been Seriously. nice Exactly. Uh, and speaking of 2024, we are almost halfway through this decade. And uh, the best way to get to our discussion tonight is to highlight that uh, John and myself, especially John, tries to stay on top of as much modern film as possible. I, I wish I could watch nearly as much as you do. Um, but it has been a really, really interesting decade of film so far. If you could if you could sum up some themes or ideas to uh, define this decade so far, what would be some of the first things that you go to? I think, um, obviously, I'm, I'm really into award season, probably much more so than most people in the hobby. Um, and I probably watch more contemporary films than most people in the hobby, um, just because our interests tend to go... Um, to the to the older stuff the stuff we grew up with or you know the av stuff or the exploitation stuff um or genre stuff so um i just it's really exciting thinking about where we're going um in the future and i mean we're living in great times i mean covid and what what you know what happened to movie theaters was a kind of a scary time but seeing what happened this last year i know it's two movies and i know it's a ridiculous campaign but what happened this this last summer was pretty special with Oppenheimer and Barbie and, you know, seeing people go to the theaters, be excited to go to the theaters and having it be part of the, you know, part of the discussion, you know, everywhere, part of right. the, the zeitgeist. And um, that's a big deal to have um, a, a, a movie talked about, not on streaming, which has, you know, has a, a, a very small window of excitement. It may be the most, you know, trending thing on the internet for a week, but that kind of disappears. Um, the fact that we're still talking about Barbie and things like Oppenheimer um, and last year, everything, everywhere, all at once, a movie that is just so obscenely out of the um, mainstream's kind of um, usual tastes, um, for that to win Best Picture, even it's um, even Oppenheimer. It's it's a three plus hour biopic. Um, with some pretty experimental um, things going on within the production, it's it's an it's an exciting time. Um, and this, obviously, the big movies are one thing, but I'm really excited about the young filmmakers coming up doing mostly genre stuff. You know, people like Robert Eggers and people like um, Ari Aster and the Safdie brothers. Well, the Safdie brothers have split, so Benny Safdie and What's the other brother's name? The other guy. <laughs> Josh uh, Mr. Safety. Safety. Yeah, Josh. Josh, yeah, Josh, Josh <laughs> um, and Brandon Cronenberg and um, Rose Glass. I'm excited for her new movie coming out. Um, it's it's kind of an exciting time for the cinema in a in a whole. I think I think it's in a really healthy place, honestly. I mean, there's doom and gloom for a long time. Um, I, I really feel like movies uh, in the contemporary landscape are really in a good place. I, I mean, shockingly would agree. There is uh, a, a let, let's just be frank. There's a lot of doom and gloom out there about a lot of this. Um, every, 
every time we get to like the interview when you're discussing something with the studio or uh, with with a theater or anything it's just so how are you going to adapt or, or how are we going to get uh to this you know newfound world where uh you, you're you're having to deal with people coming in not expecting you know the world from you your prices are so high you're just going down the drain you, you're you're going out of business and it's so it's so interesting to see a rise in really what is probably going to be the the thing that will keep theaters going, which is the experience. Things like Barbenheimer, things like uh, the Alamo Draft House being so successful because it is a place that you can go to respect cinema, where they don't allow all of the you know the, the cell phones and the talking and all of the bullshit that you have to fight during terrible screenings. So tonight we are discussing. Uh, to, to keep the love for modern film alive, so far in the decade, our 10 favorite films. Again, favorite, not best. Uh, uh, there, there are quite a few uh, films that would be on this list that are not on my list, but really just the films that have stuck with us. And I'm really trying not to be recency biased about many. Uh, I don't know how many you got from 2023. I think I only got two, but um, it's been a really, really interesting decade because it's mostly been in a pandemic, which changes a lot of things. Yeah, that's true. It's um, 2020 is always going to kind of be one of those years that we uh, it's sort of going to be a bookmark, you know, kind of, kind of year, the year that was lost, you know, it's, um, but it also um, it's, it's, there's been a lot of exciting things. Um, I have, I think I have two 2023 releases. So I kind of spread the love. My list um it's kind of an interesting exercise going back and looking and thank God for letterbox for, you know, being able to like, agree. Go back. Look, I mean, what a great tool. Um, it's um, the movies that I maybe had in my top 10 films of those years, 2020, 21, 20, even 22 last year. Um, some of those movies aren't going to be on this list because they haven't stayed with me um, as much as some of these other films, like just like anything, any, you know, even, you know, it's it's a movie that uh, has you know, kind of embedded itself in me. And time is a is a good test of um, how good a movie actually is. Um, and so it's stuff that I've watched the most. It's stuff that I think about most often. Um, and it's filmmakers that I'm most excited for. Um, and I think it's a pretty good, um, well-rounded list. I, I I agree. That's exactly how I feel. Um, I'm. Uh, there's a couple I'm shocked that didn't make their way into my top 10 that I really thought would. And looking back again, uh, when, when I start talking about tools that are useful for people in this hobby, Letterboxd is going to be nearly the top of that list. Um, some of these that I looked back on, I went, why did I rate that so low? I've watched this movie like three times in the last four years. Mm -hmm. I love that movie. And uh, I, I also found some that I rated high and I went, man, that had no lasting power with me whatsoever. Uh, there, there's a lot of reflecting over these last yeah, four same. years. Totally the same. I actually, not that anyone looks at my list on the letterbox. I was like, I gotta make a little adjustment here. This is like, this is wrong. <laughs> I don't feel this way anymore. <laughs> yeah, um, I, I definitely felt that like underwater. I, I had rated fairly lowly and that was not the right way to say that fairly low. And looking back, I'm like, I kind of love it. underwater. That movie's oh, yeah, that, that, that incredible. Movie, that, that movie slaps. That's a, that's a. That's a diamond in the rough. Yeah, I would agree. All right, uh, let's. Uh, we're we're gonna have lots of tangents tonight. I'm sure lots of discussions about all ten of these. I'm very curious to see how many cross over because I know that you you watch many many more movies than me. I, I think we're gonna have at most maybe two or three the same. So let's hear your number ten, sir. All right. Well, it wouldn't be an, a John DeMarco appearance on your channel without me bringing up this film. My number <laughs> ten film. Will be tw is 2022's Elvis by Baz Luhrmann. Um, I like this movie so much more than, than than everybody else. I feel like I feel like I'm on an island all alone on, on Elvis Island, which is with Elvis fun. maybe still alive. <laughs> uh, I just you know Baz Luhrmann. There is there are not many auteurs out there whose work is immediately recognizable um, just visually by looking at it. Wes Anderson's one of them, obviously. Um, I think Baz Luhrmann's right there, and it's such a um, it's such a stylistically sound movie, and, and there, there's and it's 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 baroque in its grandness, and it's uh, the subject matter 
with Elvis and his life and who he was, it just lends itself to Baz Luhrmann's style so much. Um, thank you. Thank you, Craig. I, I really appreciate that. Um, but it, uh, I would say, honestly, the movie that I've revisited the most on my top 10 list is probably Elvis. I've watched the movie a ton. Um, wow. I think it's just, it's just spectacle filmmaking and um, it's ridiculous and it's wonderful. And um, it's great. My number 10. I still have yet to see this. Uh, I, I apologize. It, it's one that is on my list. Um, I don't hate all ba uh, Boz films. It's just most of them. Um, <laughs> I I get it. And I, I do appreciate like the auteur theory behind this one director, because again, literally you can show a frame from any of his movies and go, Oh yeah, I know. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Not, not even a question about it. It's, it's a really great thing uh, to, to be able to do that, obviously, but I don't know. Uh, first off, the Elvis story really isn't compelling to me. That's the biggest thing. I just he he was the star among stars, and you think Taylor Swift is big right now? I mean, Elvis was the was the king. I mean, he was and he was the king before social media, before tabloids. He was everywhere. He was in he was in movies. I mean, and. It, the movie does a, a, a funny thing where the performances obviously are incredible and the way they're shot and cut and edited and are great, but it's, um, it, it leaves you, it leaves you on a final image of him that is kind of actually quite sad. And, um, I think the movie couldn't have ended in any other way, um, because of the way that his life ended, I guess, and his personal life. Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, um, it's a hopeful, it's hopeful. It's, it's, it runs the gamut. I, I just, I really have, I just, this movie kind of just vibes with me. It really does. That's good. I, I'm glad you love it. I, I will never yeah. take that away from somebody. And it actually um, inspired one of the, uh, uh, you know, one of my most popular moments from uh, one of the, during the baseball season. I, I took one of Baz Luhrmann's eight box split screens where they're flying all over the screen. And I did that during a Mets baseball game and, the world didn't know what hit them. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to see that example, uh, we showed that in the interview with John uh, the first time that he had his own video on the channel. So go check it out. Um, it's I, I, the, the amount of things that you've taken inspiration from is incredible. But even that one, like, sure, I've not seen the movie, but mm -hmm. the artistry behind it is missing from sports altogether. Yeah, I really just that's I mean, how could it, how could it not sort of. Um this hobby and this interest and this lifestyle. I mean, it's, it's sort of implanted on me, you know, in, in my day to day. And that includes what I do for, for a living. So um, I can't wait to, to see what comes out of me next. Cause I'm not even sure what it is, what it's going to be. <laughs> you just never know. I, uh, I, I appreciate your passion for that. And now <laughs> I, I feel kind of embarrassed because I just looked at my list and uh Holy hell, there's a lot of A24 on my list. Um. <laughs> dude, dude, same. same. I mean, it's, it's been a big few years for them. It has. It has. Uh, number 10, I've got my first one from them, which I've not really talked about all that much on this channel. And that is with how much I love 2021's Come On, Come On. Mm. Uh, this movie is just wholesome and meaningful and beautiful to look at and uh just artistically directed by mike mills in a way that you don't expect for joaquin phoenix and just this little kid to to randomly have this connection driving across country and this is one that has stuck with me and obviously a big part of that especially for somebody like john and myself we've got young kids and this hits home in so many scenes of just how quirky kids can be how odd their dialogue is because they feel like it how uh, they see things differently, how it means different things to them. And this movie is just, it's its saccharine, but not so much that you get an awful toothache. It's, it's that perfect homey vibe of, I could just totally snuggle up and watch this movie at any point in my life. Yeah. It's a, it's a very cozy, but it's, it's not, it's not like, um, it's not without its awkwardness and like, it's got its, um, it's got it's got some moments in there that aren't exactly warm, but you brought up right. you brought up being being a dad, and I actually am one of those fuckers suckers that goes to A24's website and like buys like the merch sometimes. <laughs> and so I bought the book 
that he reads, um, Joaquin Phoenix reads, and I bought it for my daughter. Nice. And it is just like the most beautiful, like little children's book I've ever read. I actually don't even read it to her anymore because I like ball when I read it. <laughs> like it's like so gorgeous and beautiful. This this, I think he does it in voiceover um, uh, in the film, and it's yeah, it's so damn good. But yes, good 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 choice. I also really like that movie. I, I adore Joaquin Phoenix for the most part. And man, does he deliver a pretty good straight man performance here. He, he's uh, he doesn't miss often. That's very true. All right. What's your number nine, sir? Number nine, a movie that another movie that people did not love from 2022. Um, I'm going with Babylon. Love uh, this movie. Da Damien Chazelle's Babylon. Um, this movie got so much flack and is still getting flack. People posting the final sequence without context and just ripping into it. Um, it is, it is a, um, you got to appreciate a big swing from a director, a guy like Davian Chazelle, who, you know, obviously has done La La Land and was super successful with it, but this is a the totally different direction. This is an overstuffed, like, there is shit pouring out of every pore of this movie, literally. <laughs> Within two um, minutes. <laughs> exactly. It's 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 about everything that makes Hollywood awful and amazing. And um, you know, any movie lover, I don't see how you don't love this movie. Obviously, the runtime is what it is. Um, but it's a it's a movie for people like us, and I cannot get enough. And the score, the score is outside of Oppenheimer's score this year, it's my favorite score of the decade so far. Wow. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, I, I love this one. Uh, this got a quite a few uh, votes in the Shelf Shock Rewind, by the way. Um, oh, nice. I, yeah, uh, this this did come out in early 2023. I don't remember which category it was most loved for. It might just be Best uh, Contemporary Studio Release. Um, this The 4K for this looks incredible. Amazing. Uh, I, I think that this is going to be one that is loved a handful of years from now when we get some separation from it and people go, oh, what was I thinking? This wasn't that bad. Um, but honestly, that kind of feels that way for all of his films. Like, there's a lot of people that hated La La Land. Uh, Whiplash got hated for people because they thought it was too brutal. Like, no, there's just passionate people out there. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, Chazelle is, I, I mean, obviously, just comparing those three films, uh, one end of the spectrum to the other, uh, just constantly. So uh, the biggest thing, love it, but also, what the hell is he going to do next? I, I don't know. I can't wait, though. Um, number nine for me is possibly the first uh, utterance of recency bias, but um, I, I have a feeling that Zone of Interest is going to last with me for quite some time. Um, I, I really did not think that this was going to make my list, but then considering how I felt after watching it and the others that were close to the top of my list, this is one of the first ones that I, uh, I I definitely feel like I should watch again. I have no desire to for quite some time. Uh, this is not really a, a rewatcher for me because, man, those last twenty minutes are uh, pretty pretty hard. Yeah, it's um, obviously films about the Holocaust and are always difficult, um, but you've never seen a Holocaust movie like this before. This is, I said it at the top, um, Glazer chains you to your seat and forces you to live with these people. Um, and it's, it's hard to do. It's a difficult watch. I mean, you feel like you feel like you are in a box watching that movie. Um, but it's kind of brilliant. I mean, the way that he constructs that film and it looking at his body of work, I mean, it's just, what a what a what a step in i mean a bizarre direction i mean yeah. <laughs> coming 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 off of I mean, he's not making a ton of movies he's made four movies in his career but the 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 variables between these movies and <laughs> it's kind of fascinating yeah um it's a uh, yeah, wild that's swing that's good, yeah all right number eight uh I'm, and I'm just noticing this is my my third 2022 movie in a row. So I guess I really loved that year. <laughs> um, Decision to leave, uh, Park Chan Wook. Wow. Um, it's um, it's the closest thing to a Brian De Palma film 
that we've gotten, like Prime De Palma that we've gotten um, in the last few decades. It's um, there's not a wasted shot in it. Stylistically, it's pretty much superior to anything I've seen um, that you're going to see on this list um, from a um, cinematography point of view. Um, it's one of the most beautiful films that I've seen in the last, this, this decade. It's one of those movies that I could literally watch without subtitles and still love it and appreciate it for what it is visually. Um, so decision to leave um, was, was, is a, is hands down easy choice for my top 10. Uh, something about this director is fascinating. And mm -hmm. I, I mean that in the, the actual definition of the word that no matter what he puts out, I will stare in just beautiful fascination because all of his pieces of work are astonishing. I mean, even, even like when they're brash and cold, uh, even when they're comedic and some of the comedy doesn't always land, even when they're attempting to do action, even when it's genuinely thrilling, all of it is just how, how is he doing this this well? And yet it doesn't stop. No, his there there are very few people making films today that have his level of cinematic craftsmanship and um his cinema language is just um it's just incredible. It's actually it's inspiring, you know, yeah. as a, someone that is, you know, creates visual you know, works in moving images, I am so inspired by watching his stuff. Well said. Yeah, yeah. that's uh that's huge. Um, my number eight is, uh, similar to you, uh, going back to the same year. Um, it's my other favorite from this year and I got to go with past lives from 2023. Um, this movie is beautiful. It's meaningful for me for what I do in my day job. It is touching. It is so subtly acted. The, the face acting in this movie does not get enough to attention the way that the, there are certain emotions conveyed literally like with a curl of the lip in this movie. And it just flies under the radar. Didn't get any love from the Academy. Um, yeah. It, it's, I get it that it's a, a quiet drama romance infused modern retelling of the story, but it's, it's so much deeper than that. I mean, even just the, the immigrant story alone embedded in this has never been told in this way of discovering your past and going back to it and taking the, uh, infusing of your your new culture, clashing that with your old culture, and basically just saying, "Let's see what wins." I mean, it is it's a beautiful story, and the three actors in this are just so underappreciated for what they turned in. Also, yeah. the fact that this is a directorial debut is criminal. It's it's kind of kind of insane. I'm like ridiculously jealous that somebody can pump this out as their first film. Um, yeah, it's very. Um, link later esque the way it deals with yes. Um, yes it's um it's almost like a time travel movie without the time machine it's like um because you're you're going it's done in, it's done in 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 sections of time the way that it's put together is kind of brilliant um but yeah it's the it's it's the the road the road not traveled it's 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 very poetic it's very philosophical and the performances are just um like you said, subtle. And there's not a bad, there's, there's not a weak performance. Even the oh. husband, um, um, John Magaro, I think his name is. Yeah. Um, he's great too. It's, it's really a, um, a special film and an, obviously a, a crazy first uh, uh, debut. Can't wait to see what uh, she does next. This is going to be yeah. a, a strong career. Okay. Number seven, I have 2021's Licorice Pizza from Paul Thomas Anderson. Um, for me, it's the quintessential coming of age story of the decade. Um, it's probably the, it's probably the one film, I, maybe not. I, well, I would say that it's probably the film I am most likely to revisit most moving forward because it's sort of a timeless um, snapshot of a of a specific time, and it's sort of. Um, it, it's sort of, it feels universal in what it has to say. Um, uh, Alana Haim is incredible in the film. Um, Paul Thomas Anderson, there's, there's, there are very few guys that have been as consistent as him uh, through the years. 
and I think his new movie has actually has DiCaprio in it. I've seen uh, a few shots of uh, of uh, on the street uh, of of him with a great mustache, and then whatever his new film's going to be. So yeah, Licorice Pizza is um, my number seven. It's a strong choice, and uh, I feel terrible because it's one that I've not seen yet. I've been trying to watch Licorice Pizza, Licorice Pizza, for quite some time. It's it's PTA. It's it's one that I'm dying to see, and it's it seems so out of his ordinary that I want to watch it so bad. But yeah, there's a there's a real innocence to it, and that's not something you always get with him. Um, and I love coming of age films, so Same. it's uh, it's it's kind of right in my wheelhouse. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'll have to prioritize that for soon, for sure. Totally. Uh, next one is one that uh, I I had heard hyped up so much, I immediately went, there's no way that this is going to be as good as everybody's saying it was. And then it was uh, somehow able to exceed those expectations. And that was 2022's RRR. Um, mm. I, am, I am such a huge fan of of this movie that I I am I, I'm shocked and also not surprised at all that a couple of the songs from this took people in the country by storm. Uh, the fact that there was you know Beyond Fest screenings and people up dancing in the aisles is mind blowing. Mm -hmm. But it goes to serve exactly what I said before we went into this. Experiences are going to sell theaters in the next ten to fifteen years, and with something like this, this is something that you go and join a culture literally a culture that you were not a part of before this film the moment you are in this audience you are now a part of this own subset and you can get lost in that moment you can find something in yourself that you've never seen before and for anybody that has never dove into indian cinema this is a really easy transition period to get into some of the more off the wall uh borderline what we would call silly compared to western cinema that is just so artistic and so much more textured than a lot of what we're used to. We're, we're, we're used to things that have this overly polished view of everything. And yet real great lasting Indian cinema is bumpy and not perfect. And so incredibly well-made for, you know, like underground caverns that look way better than they have any right to with <laughs> some of the silliest acting that you've ever seen put in front of it this is a really great step to get you into that. And I'm so glad that it delivered on that. And I, I adore this movie for everything that it did for Indian cinema, for everything that it did for people that love movies. This is incredible. Yeah, man, that's a good choice. I mean, this is not only gate, a gateway to a whole nother world of film that, you know, not American audiences and, you know, mainstream audiences can experience, but it's, I mean, I brought up spectacle filmmaking. This movie is spectacle filmmaking. I mean, it is just kind of amazing. And I still, I still to this day pull up the, the Natu Natu song uh, on Netflix. Like it's like it's paused on Netflix for, on that moment because I pull it up for like me and my daughter to dance around to <laughs> like all the time. So um, yeah, I mean, it's kind of kind of cool that a movie like that, um, as bonkers as it is, and as long as it is. Um, yeah. be recognized um, not only during award season, but by, you know, by a mainstream Netflix audience. So good choice. Glad you liked that. All right. Number six. Um, where were we at? The Northman 2022, Robert Eggers. I know you didn't love this one, um, but man, I really, I've watched this two or three times since, uh, since last year, I guess 2022. Um, and it's just action, revenge, badassery. Um, but it still has that Robert Eggers like patina of authenticity that we all love with him. Um, it's just really stunning filmmaking, great performances. Um, I'm a sucker for revenge movies anyway. And this movie kind of. Um, as far as modern films go is probably my favorite revenge film um, of the last probably 10 years or so. But um, yeah, I, uh, I, I really, really love Robert Eggers, everything he's, he's done. Um, I can't wait for Nosferatu. 
Um, Same. I, I, in the, the commentary on this disc, it's, I mean, the Northwind, Northwind was kind of hell for him to make. Um, uh, the studio, you know, was a big pain in the ass. I mean, that's what happens when you get a budget like he had for that movie. Um, I don't think he's ever going to work with the studio again. Probably. I don't, I don't think not, I don't think Nosferatu is, um, is a, a studio for me. I think might be back with a 24, maybe actually. Um, I do, I do think we need to redefine what studio means in 2024. Yeah, yeah you're right about that. It's true. <laughs> A24 has won two Academy Awards now for Best Picture. So, Well, and they're literally as powerful as most modern studios at this point. Absolutely. You get the, sta- the, the stamp of approval on them. You're, you're set. I mean, I've been in theaters where people cheer when the A24 logo pops on the screen. <laughs> That's so like, true. Really? Are- so <laughs> true. We're, we're there now? Um, but yeah, the Northman, um, my number six film, I think it was my fit. I think it was my number one movie of 2022. Wow. Um, I, I need to watch this one again. It, it very well may have been just the night that I watched it. I was not, not ready for a crazy revenge story like this. I do think this has some of the most beautiful sequences from that year for sure. Random off the wall, like. I would not have guessed that this scene was going to be in this movie and yet it is. And it's just stupendously directed. Uh, Eggers is great at what he does. I, I will give him that. It is a wonderfully directed movie for sure. Yeah. There's some very surreal imagery in that movie that I am kind of obsessed with. I just, it's, it's bonkers. The fa- the fact that he yeah, got away with doing that film uh, is kind of spectacular, you know, there's a there's a clip going viral now on on, on social media. I'm sure you've seen it. <laughs> it's the scene where um, uh, I'm I'm blanking out on the on the uh, uh, Skarsgård mm. Alexander Skarsgård jumps off the boat, <laughs> and it's literally 30 seconds after he finds out that he knocked up <laughs> his uh, his girlfriend. And so they're like, this is literally 30 seconds after he found out he knocked her up and he's diving off the boat. So that, that's been going viral recently, but no context, obviously. Yeah, of course not. That's There's no nuance on the internet in these days. No, 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 no. Um, my next one, number six. Uh, so this is, this is an interesting one. And a lot of people uh, are probably think that this is his worst movie. And a lot of people are probably thinking that he's on this list primarily because... He's been on this channel. Uh, I am needing to go with Sean Baker's Red Rocket. I like this movie way more than I ever expected to. Um, This movie just felt, I mean, to be fair, all of Sean's stuff does, that it feels so real. And just literally a, a filmmaker dropped in and took a snippet of somebody's life and put it on film. And yet everything in this delivers the enjoyable experience that I really wanted to, and it's funny and absurd and kind of gross and oh so very Texas and hits so many necessary points that are real in people's lives, like poverty and stolen valor and, uh, you know, things like statutory rape and uh, all kinds of just weird things all roped into a movie that ends up just being, just a good story told really remarkably well and it gets this background of this borderline just straight boring texas town and because it's him it it is gorgeously filmed i i love everything about this uh this movie was great the disc release is surprisingly good we have a cat ellinger commentary on an a24 release i mean this is this is a a shockingly underappreciated movie in my opinion yeah, I haven't revisited revisited it since I saw it. I remember I remember liking it, not loving it. But Sean Baker's films in general are are unique, uniquely lived in. They're like um, there's no sugarcoating any any of it. Um, they're still cinematically shot, yeah. but they're almost documentary like in their form. You know what I mean? It's um, it's a fascin it's a fascinating. Uh, uh, philosophy when it comes to shooting a movie it's not necessarily my favorite style um but i can certainly appreciate something like that um despite the fact that the lead was a real scumbag <laughs> yeah <laughs> i would agree yeah. with that yeah <laughs> uh, all right um number five i have 2020s 
Possessor from Brandon Cronenberg. Um, I really loved his his debut, Antiviral, which was I think seven or eight years prior to this. Yeah. But for me, this was Brandon Cronenberg coming onto the scene. This was his arrival. Um, it's a brilliant premise. It's um, it's in camera effects are. Um, they're becoming more and more common now, but are sort of groundbreaking for 2020, a return to, to in-camera effects, the way that he did them. Um, it's immersive to the point of almost like uh, like repulsion. It's like you feel this movie. Like it is dirty. It is uncomfortable, um, it, it, but it is also just beautifully crafted and it is the arrival of i think one of the one of the great young directors uh, out there and a guy that whose whose films i will be there on opening night for as long as he's making them and i have a feeling we're going to hear more about him soon uh, <laughs> yeah <you are. laughs> no uh yeah this is this is a great pick uh love this movie need to rewatch it um this movie this movie rocks and it comes across as exciting in every scene, which a lot of movies, uh, I understand they take a break. Um, this movie doesn't do that very often. It is very much a let's start running and not slow down. So we cross that finish line and it's a, it's a great one. Love this movie. Yeah. And it's, it's, I mean, it's, he's taking a page from his dad, but it's not body horror with a wink and a nod, the way that his dad does it, you know, his dad, his dad movies, his dad's movies are very funny. Um, when you, when you look at them, this is not, this has no humor in it whatsoever. This is a very cold and sanitary, uh, way of storytelling, but it's perfect for the way, for, for the story that it is. The body horror is more, um, I feel like of the mind than it is the flesh. It's more, um, it's, it, it's, it's more psychological than it is outward body horror. It's also very mechanical. Uh, something about the last few years of both Cronenbergs is yeah. very, very mechanical. So it's a, totally. uh, it fits in very much in its in its time. Um, my number five. So uh, this is one that I, uh, I got to be honest, I did not expect this one to show up on my list. But the more I thought about it, the more I realized I have recommended this movie maybe more to more people in the last four years than any movie ever in my life. Um, I I watched this and felt like I was watching uh, a horror movie, but realized there was nothing horror about it. Uh, this is one of the most awkward, cringe-inducing comedies that I've ever seen, and I had to put uh, the masterpiece from Emma Seligman from 2020 on here called Shiva Baby. Um, this uh, delivered Rachel Sennett to the world in a way that uh, I, I will never, ever be able to thank her enough because Rachel Sennett is a gift to cinema. <laughs> and uh, what she's done since this movie is amazing. What she continues to do will be great. Uh, for those that have no idea somehow, this got a pretty wonderful release from Utopia, which is an OCN partner label uh, through Vinegar Syndrome. And it is uh, about a college graduate who has a sugar daddy. And uh, she goes and, and sees this person and then ends up at a family shiva. And as she's there, uh, she recognizes that the sugar daddy is also there. And the, the big thing about this movie is they use the awkward tension of many different scenarios at the shiva uh, to, to really make you feel horrible. And also laugh at almost every single scene. But what really got me about this movie is the music in this feels like it's straight up out of like Jordan Peele's Us. And they they ripped that music, put it over an awkward party scene, and suddenly you feel like this family's about to get murdered. And <laughs> somehow you're caught up in this and your heart rate goes up and yet you're laughing. And by the end you go, what just happened? Everything about this is surprising and exciting and something that you can look back on and go, I I don't know what happened, but it's such a wonderful experience that I can't wait to watch it again. Yeah, that's a that's another good choice. I love that movie. That probably will be one of my um my honorable mentions if I had to go back and do it. Um it uh you Brits the, the music is brilliant. We're you're talking about I think 
you're talking, you're talking about debuts before. I think that's a debut film as well. I mean, it is. that is yeah. pretty spectacular. And she followed it up with a movie that I didn't love as much, but I know has been almost globally uh, uh, gotten good, uh, good, good ratings from for Bottoms, um, also starring her. Um, but yeah, I think that that's a, a phenomenal choice. There is, there are, there are awkward moments in that film are that are as horrific as anything that will be on any of our lists. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so glad you agree. <laughs> uh, my number four. I don't know how you do the comments and do this. I am like, so like <laughs> <laughs> Ronnie I, says, I, I tried to watch this, but it made me so irritated and anxious. I switched it off after 30 minutes. That's my wife. I can't watch anything that has any anxiety with her because she's like, my life is stressful enough. I cannot watch this right now. <laughs> yeah. Um, my number four is this year's best picture, Oppenheimer. It's going to, it's <laughs> calling it now. Cohen. You know, I, I, I talked about this movie a lot when we did our Oscar reveals. It's just, um, this movie is a physical experience. At least it was for me. Um, I saw it in the theater three times. Um, I could, I could drop everything right now and go watch it again. Three hours, no problem. Um, it's a shot of adrenaline. It's, um, there are moments, there are moments in this film where the score and the picture is just a line. And it's one of the more overstimulating experiences that I think I've ever had in a movie theater, um, where the music just hits right. And the, the visuals are almost, um, they're almost experimental in a way. Yeah. Um, and I, I just think it's a, it's it's about as close to uh, a perfect movie as we've had this decade. You know, it's 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 um, it's tough to top, and for mainstream audiences to really embrace it. Obviously, the directors Christopher Nolan, they're going to embrace anything he does, except for Tenet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's pretty cool, um, and it's. It will. Uh, it's definitely de deserving of the number four spot on my list. I, I laughed really hard. I think there was a quote from him this week that said, "You're not meant to understand everything in Tenet," and I just laughed so hard at like, "Okay, all right, got so, it, got okay. it, Chris." <laughs> <laughs> right. That that's when he became Chris Nolan instead of Christopher. Um, <laughs> uh, yes. So Oppenheimer is is an incredible film. It's a feat that uh, to be able to make the world so interested in a biopic about you know what you could argue is a really not great person um is something of a feat and he he did it in a way that uh you know it capitalized on the weirdest of things obviously you've got a a very famous lead actor but not somebody that's known for being the lead in many things and yet he hinged everything on this overwhelmingly just incredible performance from somebody that is so so stoic and in a lot of his performances he is the exact opposite of that he's like this weird underbelly creature in many of his films and yet he is everything that he needed to be like perfectly primp and and totally just on top of everything in this movie and you know the score is something that we could talk about probably for the next half hour alone Amazing. it's incredible uh but this being a popular movie is so odd to me. The fact that this got a claim from people that you would never expect to watch this movie is such an interesting, interesting trend for, for film this year. Yeah. I mean, almost, almost universally, universally applauded as, you know, for a theatrical experience. It's pretty cool. And we, we talked about zone of interest, the, 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 the sound mix in that, um, there, there is, there are some really interesting things um, going on with the mix in Oppenheimer too, especially if you've seen the film um, during the moment that the um, he gives his speech to the to the to the uh, rowdy crowd after they after the test, um, or maybe it's after they actually drop the bomb. No, it's after the test. Um, it does some pretty horrific things visually and with the audio that are. Um, pretty jarring. I, I think it was our episode on uh, the Oscars where I brought it up, but 
I, I hope this continues. I feel like we are entering an incredible period for sound. Something about the last, uh, I, I can't even say the last two years, but like the last 18 months of cinema mm -hmm. has been amazing for sound. It really makes me jealous of everybody that has Atmos setups at home. And I, God, I hope to be able to get back there soon. <laughs> yeah, I, 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 I'm actually fortunate enough to have one set up. I never get to use it because my daughter sleeps at, you know, it's about eight o'clock. <laughs> right. And so, and it shakes the house. Um, so I don't actually ever actually get to use it, but it's nice to look at. <laughs> um, but yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, the, the medium has, has, has come so far visually and there's only so many, so many ways you can go. I mean, Jim Cameron's invent, inventing his own, you know, medium, but, uh, you know, the sound is really where you can elevate a movie. And there's so many channels now where there's so much nuance in the, in the editing. It's, it's, it's pretty spectacular what they can do with um, the, the spatial editing when it comes to watching a movie. And that's why the theater experience is so important because not, not many yeah. people have an Atmos set up or even surround sound. Yeah, I, I would agree there. There's, I mean, talk to me. I don't think would have worked nearly as well as it did on me in the theater if I was at home just watching it with my TV speakers. Oh yeah, man. That thing, I mean, you you hear whispers and are over your shoulder in that movie, man. That is an unbelievable mix. Same thing, uh, Evil Dead Rise did the same thing as last year. Yeah, and horror really can highlight what the, what that spatial audio can can do. It's pretty special. Uh, from Oppenheimer to my number four, which, uh, I, I think if I gave everybody in the chat about 50 guesses at what my top 10 was going to be, I don't think anybody would have named this film. Most people have probably never even heard of this movie. Uh, I have to go with a movie from 2020 that immediately reinvigorated a love for so many things that I had as a child. And that was Adam Brody starring in the kid detective. Did you see the kid detective? No, I did not. So uh, Adam Brody stars as uh, literally a, a child detective. Uh, obviously, he's not the child, but uh, they show like when he was younger, he was solving cases for the neighborhood, silly things like who stole the bike or whatever like that. And then out of nowhere, uh, he is an adult now, doesn't have a job, and he gets thrust in this situation mm -hmm. where somebody uh, found out that her boyfriend was murdered, mm -hmm. and he is back on as the detective to find out who killed the boyfriend. And this is an R-rated version of everything I loved about the Hardy Boys, Nancy Drew, Scooby-Doo, Encyclopedia Brown novels, all wrapped up into this comedic masterpiece of modern nuance in just weird indie cinema. And everything about this leads into this crescendo of solving a mystery that is genuinely compelling in a movie that's very, very silly and is just so original. Everything about it is not being done in any other movie. Adam Brody is delivering a performance that is done in earnest, uh, but also as this person that's very desperate and lost and needing to find himself. And it's so well done and hardly anybody has seen this. Uh, easily one of my favorites, one that I've watched multiple times. I can't even remember who told me about this movie. It's one I had to seek out because I didn't know it was ever, it, it existed. I, I had to go find that it was even released. This movie's amazing. And this is the sound of me adding it to my watch list. I, 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 <laughs> I, 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 I mean, I'm sold. I mean, that sounds great. I, I, I don't know that I knew that. I don't know what that is. I, I don't think I've ever heard of that movie. Um, so that's a, that's a great choice. I mean, I mean, Anytime I can add a movie to, to my watch list, I'm, I'm in. I, I think most people in the chat, especially if you're anywhere near my age, give or take 10 years on either side, and you remember those mystery stories growing up, you will probably love it. Yeah, I think you and I are like almost exactly the same age. Yeah. I, I turned 37 in May. I just turned 37 last month. So, so yeah, there you go. Perfect timing. <laughs> Top three. Top three. My number three. A 2020, a 2021 film by an, another exciting young director who I can't wait to see what she does next. Um, Titan from Julia Dockernau. Um, French film. Her follow-up to her 2016 film, which I also love, Raw. Um, now, this movie is bonkers. This movie is... Um, it won the Palme d'Or 
um, that of that year. Um, it's a movie where you easily accept that a person is knocked up by a Cadillac. <laughs> um, and that's like that's like the third or fourth weirdest thing that happens in the movie. Um, you really have to be on this film's wavelength early. Um, but for me, at least, I bought in instantly um, with the first shot of the film. And so I was there for it from the very beginning. Um, you don't really know. I hate to be cliche. You don't really know whether the laugh, cry or like vomit uh, while watching this film it, it's it's i must have a thing for body horror because it's like the third or fourth film on here but i like this is like a this is very cronenbergian like this movie is um it's um it has a voice that um i not many films are being made like this being made no. by a, a woman director in 2021 it's it feels um it feels meaningful um and I can't wait to see what she does next. I mean, she's two for two. Um, I've, lo- I mean, the, the those two first films. I mean, in 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 the horror community, to 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 have those as your top two, because I do consider it more of a horror film. Uh, Teton, um, Raw is more overtly horror, um, but that is that's an exciting young filmmaker. I I agree. I I've enjoyed both of these immensely. Mm-hmm. Help uh, me out. Thank you, Sibner. Ducorno. Uh I, I believe T- uh, Titan was uh I'd have to look at my list real quick. I think it's number it's uh 12 on my list. So it's it's in my oh, honorable nice. mentions. Uh this is definitely up there for me. Um I loved Raw. I I really want to do I, it, it sounds like it would be a really obvious double feature, but I, I kind of really want to watch Raw and Titan in one night. And just see how they vibe together because they're they're so different, yet her her style like it it's still there. the The tone of what she's doing is just subservient in a weird, interesting way. And Ra seems to have this lasting power that broke a little more mainstream than Teton did, which I get yeah. it because there's no car fucking in Raw. But <laughs> um, <laughs> the, something about both movies they are they're just really well done and and the it, it feels weird to say the chemistry about a movie about car fucking but the the chemistry in both films really works and it's so organic that you don't doubt it at all yeah it's 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 provocative without trying to be provocative like the car the car the car fucking is is one thing but there's so much more being said in that movie right um it, it's um it's really, it, it's very, it's, there's not many voices out there that are this sign, sign, uh, like signature and loud. And um, it's really fierce filmmaking. Like there's like jagged edges everywhere. Um, but that's part of what makes the film great. Fully, fully agree. Yeah. This is a big one. If you've not sought it out yet, strongly recommend it. Uh, Simoner's pointing out that there was rumblings that Second Sight may have it considering they did Raw mm-hmm. and some others that were with Decal just like this one. So it's possible that that's coming, uh, but also there's a decent looking blue out there just in case you, you just want to get something cheap to check it out first. It's it's well worth your time. Yeah, Second Sight would be a great home for that. I agree. And it, also this could be a really great 4K release. It's a beautiful movie. This would be a yeah, I would happily upgrade the 4K with this one. Uh number 3. Wow, I thought I was on 2. Number 3. Uh this is no surprise for anybody, I'm sure. 2022 is everything everywhere all at once. Um this is this is one from the first 4 years that I I, I firmly believe we're going to be going back to for decades. Uh this movie is going to be um, exciting for people that are discovering it in a few years and go, I, I heard about this for so long. What is this? Oh my God, this is amazing. But the thing that I may be more excited about, imagine the people this is going to inspire. What we're going to see in eight years from filmmakers that saw this when they were 18, 19 and went, how how interesting can I make something coming out of film school in 2029? How can I uh, you know, approach my filmmaking in a way that tells a story that I never thought I was allowed to tell until I saw this film. And the way this can open those sort of storylines for people is breathtaking. Um, The performances in this are amazing. Uh, I've, I've waxed poetic on this channel long enough about this movie, but this movie is 
uh, emotional in every single emotion that you can think of and beautiful all at once. Yeah, it's um, for a movie like that to win Best Picture and not only Best Picture, but just sweep everything. Every Every little everything everywhere all at once. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's it's kind of amazing. I mean, I love I love weird movies. I love weird shit. And that movie, the first time I watched it, almost was a little too weird for me. And it won Best Picture. <laughs> I since watched it two or three times. Um, and it's one of those movies that really gets better as the more yep. you watch it. There's so many layers on, on, on in that film. Um, and you brought up the performances. It's just um, Michelle Yeoh and um, the return of Ki Hu Kwan. And it's just, um, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, a miracle of a movie um, for everything to come together. Uh, so many moving pieces and so many, different genres it's operating in for it to come together so beautifully and perfectly and really be kind of heartwarming at, at its core. It's really kind of a, a, a miracle film for me. Uh, I, I teased the Patreon stuff earlier. One of the things that I'm doing for Patreon in the next couple of weeks is I haven't done a pickup video in a couple months because I've been so busy and I'm, I'm going to limit the number of films that I show, but I have something from everything everywhere all at once that I think people will be really excited to see that I'm, I, I'm astonished that I have it, and uh, I, I can't wait for people to to revel in the artistic side of it. Ooh, so, what a tease! <laughs> come check it out. Uh, where are we at? Number two. Number two. Number two. The second appearance for this filmmaker. You really, I'm really as I'm going through this. There's quite a theme to my to my list. Infinity Pool, 2023. Not number one. Interesting. Number number, number two. Infinity Pool. Um, I talked about this movie a lot during our Oscar show. Um, it's just sort of a visual orgy of bodily fluids and weird filters and sound <laughs> effects. And um, yeah, it goes places that a lot of uh, a lot of uh, outside, even outside of mainstream films won't go. The unrated cut is crazy. <laughs> I mean, it's I mean, it's. The, the things on there are, are kind of amazing. Um, <laughs> um, this thing really, it really has, it really has you squirming in your seat. I just, I just really love brash young filmmakers like Cronenberg and, you know, two or three of the other filmmakers that I brought up tonight. It's just, um, they're doing things that really inspire me. And that's, that's kind of, that's kind of how I did this list. Or who are the, what are the films that make me want to, get out of my seat and create, you know, whether, whether it be any, it could be anything, you know, I, I'm lucky enough to have a, um, a job where I can sort of tunnel a lot of this inspiration into. Um, but this is, this is a movie that I have revisited three or four times um, over the year. And it's, um, you would be hard pressed to find something more original than this on my list. And that's saying something given I just talked about Teton um, but I really believe that in Cronenberg, I, like I said, when I talked about Possessor, um, he's a filmmaker who I will see anything he puts out um, uh, on opening night. Interesting. I, I could have sworn this was going to be your number one, and I'm just now itching yeah, I, to hear what I, that is. Yeah, I, I, I forgot. I forgot about this one when I, when I brought up um, my, my top movie of 2022. Damn. Uh, well, uh, my number two happens to be a 2022 film. Uh, so I'm going to go with that one next. And, uh, I, I think that this is, uh, I think for years, I'm going to look at this as one of the most outstanding directorial debuts ever. And that's Charlotte Wells after son. <laughs> that's my, uh, <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, <laughs> As as a father of young children, as somebody that has bawled watching this movie twice, uh, this movie is, is special. Paul Meskel gives maybe one of the best performances of the last 10 years that I cannot fathom. I'm starting to get like goosebumps and tear up a little bit right now. Um, yeah. He... He takes what it is raising young children and makes it into this like 
happily tragic story. And the ending, the ending needle drop for this is one of the most immediately gratifying scenes that you'll see in any film. Um, Charlotte Wells directed this movie in a way that is so magnetic to draw you into every scene when overall, this is not a story where a lot happens. Uh, this is a very slow, um, just dramatic tale of childhood essentially. But in that it's a tale of childhood, but it's more of a story of the parenthood behind that childhood. And when you, you see the way that Meskel and uh, Frankie Corio are, together and not related in any real way it seems impossible uh they they interact in the most authentic way compared to any other film on my list i think um this is a masterpiece yeah it's it's my number one movie of the decade and it's one of my favorite movies of all time i think there are very few movies um and well said by you there are very few movies that have ever impacted me the way that this movie does um and it's sneaky about it like you said it's very slow um but when it comes when it hit when it hits it really hits the film's final moments um all i have to do is think about them and i feel myself on that verge of yep. just just a total waterworks i mean it's um I mean, it's forever changed that song. That's for sure. Um, <laughs> Absolutely. Pressure, I mean, without, without a doubt, it's, um, it's absolutely brilliant. And I, and, and Charlotte Wells, we brought up our age. She actually is, um, uh, thir I think she turns 37, like a week or two before me. So she's like exactly the same age as us. And so we would have been the same age as Frankie Corio's character at the time that this film um, was taking place and so a lot of it is there's a there's a weird authenticity to the way that it's the story is unfolding yeah. um it's the way that the way that i interpret it is um it's as it's if you grew up when we grow up my dad always um we had a camcorder in the family and so he always had a camcorder on his shoulder taping everything and so and a lot of my memories of my youth i'm never quite sure if they're my memories or they're memories of the videos that i watched later on and this movie kind of perfectly um it encapsulates that feeling for yeah. the entire runtime and then it takes what that nostalgia and that storytelling device and turns you on your head with a climax that is as good as is a, a, as good a final 10 minutes of a film maybe that i've ever seen i don't want to be speaking high, high, hyperbole here but it's it's i i am so moved by the by the final moments of this film and you don't have to be a dad to 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 appreciate this film this 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 film this film is able to um uh manipulate your emotions in a way whether it whether you're 80 years old or or, or 10 years old or whatever your gender may be it's it's at the end of the day it's just good storytelling and yeah. it's um it's a masterpiece. It's I I I'm a, I, I don't like throwing around that word, um, but it's a masterpiece, and it's a film that I knew immediately after I finished watching it that it was not only my favorite movie of the year, but it's going to be something that um, is going to be part of my life forever. Um, it's that important of a movie to me. So hard. I mean, it's a hard sell. <laughs> I, I'm I'm amazed. I think this was our only crossover, uh, and it I love that it's this one. I mean, yeah, me too, man. This movie is so so good. Um, I <laughs> I'm genuinely like on the verge of uh, tears right now just thinking about this because yeah. th there's so many scenes like you know you brought up the camcorder plays such a big part in this that you are 
you're witnessing almost like third hand some of these stories and feeling nostalgia that is crafted in a way like I, I felt nostalgia for things I never experienced. I mean, yeah. these these single parent vacations, that was never a thing for me. I, I also didn't even really have vacations like this as a child. I didn't get to go to places like this. And yet, because I was that perfect age through the story that they were telling when it was being told, it felt so real. Everything about this was uh, it just delivered. I mean, th there's a few movies, and funny enough, they're all A24 that have done the same sort of thing. Lady Bird is an incredible piece of 2002 period piece. It hits it perfectly. The 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 attire, the slang, the the weird, awkward maneuvering of teenagers at that time. I was that age for when Lady Bird was made. It was exactly what it was. The mid '90s movie that Jonah Hill made. It, the exact same thing nails the skate culture of the nineties in a way that it is an incredible period piece, but this is, uh, the, the piece de resistance of a 24s period pieces for people our age. Um, this is truly a masterpiece. And if you haven't checked it out, I, uh, I, I urge you to, in a way that is, uh, borderline adamant. Um, this is like a must see for, for film lovers. Yeah, everybody, everybody, absolutely. This is this is. If you get one thing out of this stream tonight, go 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 see this movie and and support Kino Lorber. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, in in a classic Ryan fashion, my number one is a bit of a cheat because I don't know if it even counts as a movie, but uh, it's on Letterbox, so I'm going to say yes. Um, I I think because. The first four years of this decade are really summed up by the pandemic. I have to go with something that is the best piece of pandemic art that we could have ever hoped for, and that's Bo Burnham's Inside. Um, this thing and the the follow up, the Inside Outtakes, are filled with music and musings of a modern Shakespearean artist that is delivering on renaissance levels of artistry that we can't comprehend through most of other, the other people that we pay attention to. This is an individual that has directed films, starred in films, done stand-up comedy, uh, started on YouTube in his parents' attic, literally. And he is somehow delivering the most philosophical versions of turning 30, uh, modern social media hot takes, um, being frustrated with the billionaire culture uh, that we find ourselves in, um, being prescient about how the inflation is going to fuck us all over and how that just sucks, um, being honest about how many people were stuck inside and genuinely, I, I, I mean, trigger warning for anybody dealing with it, but genuinely suicidal during this time. Uh, I get it, and you were not alone, and Bo Burnham delivers that message so specifically that I, I really hope everybody out there has been subjected to this at some point because it is uh, a hand holding through, you know, for many people, the most harrowing time of, of modern life. I mean, people lost loved ones that they had no reason to lose just because some people didn't wear a mask or didn't get vaccinated or didn't pay attention. I mean, we've had a lot of loss based on this and this is like one of the only good things that I can say came from the pandemic. Wow. Yeah. I, I actually have never seen this and I, I know about this because I, I, I visited your letterbox and it's your, it's your header on yeah. your letterbox. And so I, it's been on my radar and I, and I kind of, I'm kind of upset and disappointed that I didn't watch it during that time. Cause it feels like a, it feels like a very important moment to, to have, to have seen that. Um, uh, but that's, um, I think that's, that's a great choice. I don't think that there's, there's, that's definitely uh, a worthy choice of number one for sure. Uh, Sibner here comments. I feel like such an outsider since I'm one of those weirdos that flourished in, during the pandemic. And I got to admit, I, I feel literal guilty uh, that I I'm the same. I, I didn't lose anybody close to me. Uh, the closest person that, that uh, passed due to COVID was uh, a parent of my sister-in-law's boyfriend. It's not related to me in any way, but it's, you know, it, it affected a lot of us. I, I feel so affected by it primarily because of my kids. I mean, my youngest was 
uh, three and a half years old at the start of the pandemic. And so in preschool, doing virtual learning, that doesn't work. Uh, yeah, so um, my daughter was born March 20th, 2020. So Holy shit. the the world the world shut down like seven days prior. Yeah, I was fortunate to to even be allowed in in the delivery room, um, but it was a scary time. I mean, the hospital was silent. Um, we couldn't leave the room. Um, it was an eerie time to have to have a baby, and it obviously went against every plan that we had over the prior nine months. Um, but the, for, the, if the, if you, if you take one good thing out of the pandemic and I, you kind of have to without, you know, going crazy, um, is that I got to spend all of that time with my daughter after she was born, um, time that I would not necessarily have had because of my job and what March usually and going into April usually means, which is opening day, the beginning of a baseball season. Um, the baseball season didn't start that year until July. And so I got to spend um, those first three plus months with my daughter um, that I wouldn't have had otherwise. So, um, yeah, that would that I'm actually in agreement that there was some good to come out of it for me or you have to take some good out of it. That would be it. Yeah. Um, the guilt that comes from that is odd to grapple with. And yeah, I think totally. there's some of that in inside. And I, I just... If you've never checked it out, it's on Netflix. The Inside Out takes, I think, are also on Netflix, but I believe that was also on YouTube. Um, they're both masterpieces. I'm sure you've heard some of the music from it just through life. Um, it, it's very, very worth it. Yeah, I um, I will definitely have to check that out. Uh, any honorable mentions you want to highlight? Honorable mentions. Let me let me let me pull it up real quick. I have. I think I have a few. Honorable mentions. I brought up Shiva Baby. Um, that would definitely be on there. I, that was one of my favorite uh, films of the year that came out. Um, ba, 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 ba. Here we are. Um, uh, from from this year alone, some honorable mentions would be um, The Killer, uh, Poor Things, and When Evil Lurks. Those would be my probably top 20 to 25 of the year. Um, a movie that I actually rated, um, I think in my number two or three of the year 2022 was Bones and All. That would be mm -hmm. um, an honorable mention for me. That's a movie that I felt very strongly about when it came out um, that has not really stayed with me as much as some other stuff has. That's why I didn't really make my list. Um, another couple other honorable mentions would be... Um, uh, Nightmare Alley from 2021, a movie that I absolutely adored from Guillermo del Toro. Um, uh, also, what else I have on here? Uh, Benedetta, which I also love from 2021. And St. Maud from 2020, that would probably be an honorable mention. Uh, Rose Glass's film. And the Charlie Kaufman film, I'm thinking of ending things. That would probably be one of my honorable mentions. Uh, just off my list, if I didn't include inside, uh, my number 10 was going to be X and Pearl as a cheat. Uh, I, I think X is more my, si my style, but Pearl is also incredible. Uh, I had Titan at 12, like I said. Um, Marcel the Shell with Shoes On is amazing. Love that movie. Another A24. Uh, underwater, like I mentioned. And then um, finally, one that I, I think people forget because it was, I think I watched it the week before the pandemic lockdown. The Invisible Man. Uh, the Blumhouse mm. Invisible Man. I loved that movie. Yeah, that movie was killer. I, what a um, what a, what a movie. I mean, that works. There, there are a few moments in that film that have kind of become iconic. You know, they're really, which you don't always get from mainstream horror or stuff right. like, you know, reboots and stuff like that. There, there are a few moments in that movie that will like kind of live forever. Fully agreed. Uh, so again, uh, after tonight, hopefully everybody's checked out After Sun, Infinity Pool, The Kid Detective, Shiva Baby, Titan, uh, RRR, Elvis. 
Elvis. Uh, oh man, that's a good pick too. Ronnie says uh, the Mitchells versus the Machines. Yeah, that I, I I'm not a big animation guy, but I love that movie. That movie is incredible. Yeah. Um, God, this has been a really good episode. I, I'm I'm so happy that you came on. I, I'm yeah, glad man, that you had a chance. Yeah, I'm so thanks for having me, man. This was um, I've been I literally have not missed an episode. Um, not always here live, but I haven't missed an episode since you've been doing this. Um, and so it's a, it's, it's, a, it's honestly my honor to be here. This is so much fun. John and I were talking before we went live. I think this, this month is two and a half years of reconnected, which is wild and only missed one episode ever. <laughs> Why was that Ryan? <laughs> uh, it was because of the Mets, uh, which is yeah. a weird sentence to say, cause I've, I've never <laughs> done anything because of the Mets other than when I celebrated when they lost in 2015. <laughs> <laughs> Good times, good times. Yeah, this has been great. Uh, like I said, check out the link for the Patreon in the description below if you're so inclined. Lots of stuff coming out. Uh, if you are interested in cinematic flares in baseball, there's no one better than John DeMarsco at SNY for the New York Mets. Please try to check out some of those. And if you just want to see an example of them, check out the interview I did with John. It's a really great piece. Um, he, he's done some incredible things that has literally been seen by millions. Yeah, and we've got some fun stuff planned for this year. There's there's a prospect this year that um, of a actual filmmaker being involved in some way um, with what we do on the Mets production side that I really hope comes to fruition. Um, it's a big deal interesting yeah so i'll tell i'll tell i'll tell you offline ryan we can we can we can uh we can tease folks chad i'll tell you next thursday i'm kidding of course <laughs> i won't um yeah this has been incredible uh everybody please come back next thursday we got a fun conversation planned uh for next week it's going to be a big one uh celeste is coming back uh the big thing is uh shelf shock rewind is right after the next week's show so i had to have celeste on to hype it up so we will see you next week um come hang out and uh until next time have a good week stay safe and uh we'll see you then Thank you for watching The Disconnected. On the way out, make sure that you are subscribed to the channel, that you've liked the video, and that you've copied the link to be able to share with someone else that may appreciate this.